So hello everyone, thank you all for coming. Uh, today's subject will be anomaly detection in telecommunications. My name is Valentina Georgievic and I work as a data scientist in a company named ThingSolver. Uh, we at ThingSolver, uh, we are located in Belgrade, Serbia and uh, we are uh, doing uh, some big data and data science uh, projects and some consulting in the same domain. Uh, here is the today's agenda. So, as a first step, we're going to talk about anomalies in the data. So, what are anomalies in the data? What, what kind of anomalies are there in the data? And uh, what are some of the possible techniques that can be used uh, for uh, anomaly detection? After that, we're going to get to the problem definition. So we're going to talk about the telecommunications, some of the main concepts, and we're trying to, uh, we, were try we will be trying to explain the data and also the user requirements and to determine the project objectives and uh, some of the benefits. After that, we're going to get to the algorithms that we were using, isolation forest and autoencoder. And for each one of them, we will try to explain uh, what are the main concepts, what are the phases, steps, what are the main parts of each algorithm and after that we're going to try to define uh, how is the anomaly score determined in each of those two algorithms. After that we're going to present some comparative analysis of the applied techniques. So we will perform some evaluation of the models that have been applied and we will walk through some, uh, uh, we will walk through some uh, advantages and disadvantages of each of those algorithms. So, uh, let us go to the anomaly detection problem. What are the anomalies in the data? Anomalies uh, are the, uh, rep they represent the type of the behavior in the data that differs significantly from some expected behavior or some uh, previously defined behavior as normal, right? And what is uh, crucial here is to distinguish those two terms, anomalies and outliers. So uh, many of us, they're using those two terms as synonyms, but we like to, uh, to distinguish them because outlier is some error that occurs. We do not want, we, we're not trying to uh, perform some root causes of the outliers. We just put them aside or smooth them in some way. Whenever, when we're trying to find the root cause of anomalous behavior, we're dealing with anomalies because anomalies are meaningful for us. They have some root cause that we want to work on, okay? So that is the main uh, uh, distinction between the anomalies and the outliers. Outliers, no meaning for us. We just smooth them or put them aside. Anomalies, they have the meaning, they have the root causes that we want to analyze. What are some of the basic types of the anomalies in the data? There are three basic types. So we have point anomalies, contextual anomalies, and collective anomalies. So let us go to the first group, point anomaly. Point anomaly represents an instance that could be considered as anomalous among all, all other instances in the data set. So it is often some extremum, irregularity, deviation that happens randomly and have no particular meaning. So if we look, take a look at the examples, on the left side, you can see that we have some instances grouped in the N2, N1 and A2 area and we have those two uh, instances that are separated from the rest of the data and those are point anomalies for us, right? The other example, if you have some uh, time series representing sales, those points here are point anomalies for us because they, are, they do not have some seasonality and they just deviate from the rest of these instances in the significant way. The other group are contextual anomalies. Contextual anomaly is an instance that could be considered as anomalous in some specific context. So whenever you're adding contextual feature like time or space, and you're combining it with some behavior, quantitative measure, measurement like total money spent, average temperature, average end user throughput, number of customers uh, that come to the store. So whenever you're combining some of the behavioral features with the contextual features, you're uh, analyzing contextual anomalies. So if we take a look at the examples, you can see that those two points, T1 and T2, they do have uh, similar values, right? They are pretty low. If this is a temperature during some period of time, 
T1 is a really low uh, temperature that is expected. Similarly low temperature in the month of June for some specific area like in Serbia that is uh, uh, unexpected and can be considered contextual in the context of time. Okay. The other example is if we take a look at the time series representing sales through some period of time, we have seasonal jumps in sales during the holiday season at the end of the year. But if we have a jump in during the summer, in, I don't know, uh, month of July, that is a contextual anomaly for us and we have to take root cause of this behavior because we want to see why this jump happened. Maybe there was some concert happening or we played some campaign or something like that. So that is the contextual anomaly for us. The third group of anomalies are collective anomalies. So collective anomalies, they represent a group of correlated interconnected or sequential instances. And what is interesting here that while each particular instance of this group doesn't have to be anomalous itself, their uh, uh, collective occurrence is anomalous. So let us walk to the examples. On the left side you have an electrical uh, cardiogram of a human heart, right? And it is usual that we have some uh, jumps and uh, lows in the signal, but if you have these low signal values for some period of time, it can point that there is some anomalous behavior of the heart. Another example, if you take a look at the sales through some period of time, those points here are expected because are seasonal events uh, happening um, due to the holiday season. But those two grouped, uh, those uh, four grouped instances here in the uh, uh, summer period are collective anomalies for us. Because maybe we play some campaign, maybe there was some music festival, some sport event or something like that. It is not happening every year, but it is happening particularly in this period that we were observing. So there are three basic types of the anomalies in the data. And what about the techniques? So there are three basic techniques for anomaly detection in the data. And the uh, choice of the anomaly detection technique that we're going to use depends on the data itself. So uh, supervised anomaly detection, it is uh, analogical to the supervised learning. So whenever you have labeled data, so you have instances for, we, for, each, for, for each one of them, you have a label whether instance is anomalous or not. We're dealing with supervised learning problem and then you can use supervised anomaly detection uh, techniques like some classification, uh, etc. But if you do not have labeled data, then you should use the unsupervised approach because you, don't have, you do not have the information about the behavior, whether it is normal or uh, anomalous. And then you just use some of the uh, unsupervised anomaly detection techniques like plastering uh, or uh, some uh, other neighborhood technique. Semi-supervised is a hybrid of those two approaches and you're using semi-supervised approach if you have partially labeled data. So if you have only information about one type of the behavior and you model only that type of the behavior. And each behavior that deviates from the normal type that you uh, modeled is considered to be anomalous. Okay? So uh, what about the process of anomaly detection in the data? Well, this process corresponds to the uh, CRISDM methodology uh, which is a cross-industry standard for data mining problems. And here, as a first step, you have domain understanding. So whenever you're working with the anomalies, the first thing you should do is to master the basic concepts of the domain that you analyze. And also, uh, you should uh, perform consultations with the domain expert in order to define the term anomaly in the specific domain. Because the anomalies, uh, they will not be the define the same way in the medicine or in the telecommunications or in the retail, banking, logistics. So you need to define what are uh, the anomalies, what is anomalous behavior for the specific domain that you're working with. After the domain understanding, we're uh, going to the data, to the data understanding. So you gather all the data, see whether your data is labeled or not, uh, perform some descriptive analysis, exploratory analysis in order to to understand the data, to see uh, what is its predictive power and also to understand the constraints of the data that you're working with. After the data understanding, we're coming to the step of choosing the technique 
and you can choose one of the uh, techniques that we previously discussed, supervised approach, unsupervised approach, and semi-supervised approach. After choosing a technique, you're going to choose a model from a given technique. So you need to determine model pre-assumptions and also to prepare the input data, so the shape that you're going to pass to the model. Then you're going, uh, then you're going to the uh, model application where you have to check if all the model pre-assumptions are satisfied. Because if you do not satisfy all the model pre-assumptions, the results you get are inaccurate, okay? And you want to prevent it. Set up initial model parameters and run it. After model training, we're coming to the model evaluation phase. And uh, it is pretty easy for you if you have labeled data. Then you can evaluate the model by using some uh, metrics like accuracy, precision, uh, to see uh, what are the uh, model performances. If you do not have label data, then you're going to the uh, harder uh, approach, consultation with the domain expert. So the domain expert can analyze the results and see uh, if they are um, uh, good or bad. After model evaluation, if you're satisfying with the model performances, you can go to the interpreting of the identified anomalies. So perform some drill down, read through analysis, perform some root cause analysis, correlation analysis, in order to see what are the main drivers of anomalous behavior. After that, you can go to the final step, which means drawing the conclusions from your analysis. So present the root causes and also define some actions that should reduce or even prevent the anomalous behavior from happening again. So those are some of the basic steps and those are some of the steps that we applied here on our project. And uh, maybe this could be expanded like for monitoring or something like that in the future, but for now those are some of the basic steps. So what about the telecommunications? So that, that, that is the domain that we're working with. For those who understand telecommunication uh, pretty good. Uh, I apologize if I uh, don't explain something well, but uh, this is a simplified image of a telecommunication network. So what do we have there? We have some uh, users with their mobile phones, tablets or something like that. We have some base stations that are connected uh, via links, microwave or optical, to the hubs and some hubs that, is connect, that, that can be connected with the network core. This here, the network core, is where the, all the magic happens, so where all the requests are pre were pro processed, etc. So what is the main idea here? To analyze the uh, behavior of the uh, main components in the network. And for now, the analysis has been done on base stations, but the idea is to expand it into the microwave links analysis. Because when we, if we know that the problem is here, we know that all the users that are accessing the network via this base station, they will encounter a problem and their user experience will reduce and they will be unsatisfied, right? We want to prevent it. If this hub here has a problem, then a huge uh, uh, number of users will be affected. And we really want to prevent this from misbehaving, right? So that is the main, main idea. I analyze some of the main uh, KPIs, key performance measures of each of these components in order to prevent anomalous behavior and in order to prevent, prevent that our users are um, not satisfied, right? Okay, so let us go to the problem definition. Problem definition by the Chris Dea methodology uh, is defined like understanding the project objectives and requirements from a domain perspective and then converting this knowledge into data mining problem definition with a preliminary plan designed to achieve the objective. So the first thing you should do is to start from the data. So what do we have? We have site, base station behavior through the time. And we have more than 100 KPIs describing the site behavior. Uh, what are those KPIs about? About packages losses, uh, packages delays, transmission success rate, everything that describes the uh, behavior of the site. Do we have labels? No, we didn't have labels available. So we do not have the information if the base station is misbehaving or not. So what is the main project objective? The main project objective is to identify anomalous sites. What is the requirement? To make it automatically. What is the data mining problem that we're dealing with? Unsupervised anomaly detection and our preliminary plan 
is to try isolation forest and auto encoders as, the mod, uh, as our models for uh, anomaly detection. What are some of the project benefits that we should discuss? You always have to discuss the benefits because if it's not beneficial for you to perform some data science, data mining problem, then you're not doing it, okay? So what are the main benefits? 24-7 health checks. So we provide the uh, uh, automatization of this process, enables continuous checks over the network parameters and fires the signal when anomalous behavior has been detected. The next benefit is efficient problem diagnosis. So uh, our tool contains information about when KPIs have been flagged, each K what KPI has been flagged as anomalous and in which point of time. And the third, process automation. So we have several thousands of base stations, 100 KPIs through some period of time on an hourly level. So we provide this process automation uh, and make the whole process of root cause analysis anomaly and anomaly detection easier uh, than to do it manually by, by the domain experts. So let us go to the um, anomaly detection models that we were using. So the first one is isolation forest. So the isolation forest algorithm, it is pretty similar to the random forest. So if you're familiar with the random forest, it will be uh, pretty um, simple uh, for you to understand it. So isolation forest is ensemble of trees. So it has multiple trees that is building. Each tree is built upon each KPI that is being analyzed. In what way? By splitting the data. So what is the idea? Uh, the more steps I need to isolate an instance in a bunch of instances, uh, the most probably that instance is normal. The less steps I need to is isolate the instance in a, uh, some um, uh, data set, the more chances are that that instance is anomalous. So the main idea here is that uh, instance, anomalous instances, they deviate from the rest uh, and we can easily isolate them. So that is the concept of isolation in isolation forest. And how is the anomaly score determined? By the average path land in isolation tree uh, from the root, uh, from the root uh, uh, node to the terminal node a given instance has been placed on. So here is a representation of isolation forest algorithm. So we have many isolation trees that are built for each of the features that we're uh, analyzing. And we have instances that are placed in some of the terminal nodes based on their values. And we just calculate the path length from the root to the terminal node an instance is placed into. The longer the path, the more the chances are it is normal. The um, uh, lo um, lower the path, the more chances are that instance is anomalous. So let us walk through some example. So if we have a feature that has this data range, we firstly sort the feature values. And uh, this can be, I don't know, weight, for example, ranging for for, uh, from 43 to 82. And as the first step, in isolation forest algorithm, isolation forest tree is built. So we, as a first step, choose a random split value from this range of values. So let it be 51. All instances having value for the weight uh, feature lower than the 51, they go to the left side of the, of the tree. All instances having value higher than the 51, they're going to the uh, right side of the tree. And this is recursively repeated, right? At this step here, another random split value has been chosen. Here is 63, and all the instances having value higher than 63 are uh, going to the uh, right side of the tree. All instances having uh, values lower than 63 are coming to the left side of the tree. So if we have our instances with these values, they are placed into these terminal nodes in a binary tree, and we calculate the path length. So for example, instance having a value of 45 has a path length of 1, 2, 3 but instance having value of 82 has a path length of only one, two. So the higher chances are that this, this, that this instance is anomalous than those instances here that have a uh, higher path length. Okay, so that is the main logic and it's pretty simple. Uh, and this is only one isolation tree, but for many features you will have many isolation trees 
and they are representing the isolation forest algorithm. What about the autoencoders? So autoencoders are practically a neural network and uh, they represent unsupervised neural network and in most cases the main goal is to train, of training the autoencoder is to provide the output that is the same as input. So what is the main idea? They work by compressing the input into a latent space representation and then uh, they try to reconstruct the output from this representation. And basically they have two parts for this task. They have encoder used for encoding the input in, into some latent space that, that uh, tries to reconstruct this encoded representation into the output that should be the same as the input. What is the idea here? The higher the error that the decoder makes when translating that uh, encoded representation into the output, the higher are the chances that a given instance is anomalous. Okay, because it couldn't model their features the right way. So anomaly score is determined by the error that the coder makes in the reconstruction phase. What are some of the main characteristics? So compression and decompression they, uh, functions, they are data specific. So they are always learning over the data. So if you train an autoencoder with, I don't know, some images of uh, animals, you cannot use them in order to uh, take a latent representation of some boats or something like that. So they are data specific and you can only use them over the data that you uh, have been tra uh, training them on. They are lossy because in the reconstruction phase, the decoder will not, the, it is unable to reconstruct all the information. So it will lose some of the information, so they are lossy. And they are automatically learned. So you play some data, they are uh, trained over the data, and they can perform the reconstruction based on the data that you're uh, feeding with, uh, them with. Uh, this makes it convenient for data denoising. So as I said, in the reconstruction phase by the decoder, you will always lose some information. And what, what is good, that information is, all, uh, in most cases, a noise. So it is good for data denoising. Also, they are good for dimensionality reduction because by using the autoencoder encoder part, you can always reduce the dimensionality of the problem that you're uh, dealing with. And they are good for the anomaly detection. That is what we have been uh, using them for. And uh, here is a simplified example of how do a out -encode, an autoencoder work like. So if we have some uh, image, this is number two, it, it, it passes to some encoder and we have a compressed representation of this image. The decoder has a task of uh, reconstruct this compressed representation into the output that should be the same as input. And if you can see, we also have here an image with a number two on it, but it is not identically the same as the input. So we have some losses here, but it reconstructed it. So, uh, before uh, going to the comparative analysis of those two algorithms, just a little disclaimer. Uh, we had to evaluate our models to, to know which model is better, what are the advantages and disadvantages of each of these models, and we didn't have label data. So what we did was we created a labeling algorithm that analyzes, I think, 10 main, main KPIs, values, and it just says, if the message transmission success rate is below some value, flag it as anomalous. If the packet delay uh, expressed in uh, time is higher than some value, flag it as anomalous. So it's pretty rough solution, but for our case here, because we're just uh, playing with the algorithms, uh, we were using it, we were talking with the domain experts, it was acceptable for them for, to use that algorithm. So we kind of uh, labeled our data. And after that, because we extracted the anomaly scores for each instance, we could flag the instance uh, as the output from our algorithms, whether be it normal or anomalous, and we tested it against our labeling algorithm. So what are the results? For the isolation forest, the accuracy uh, was 72%, while for the autoencoder, the accuracy was 69%. What are some of the main uh, advantages and disadvantages? Well, for the Isolation forest, isolation forest is pretty fast and pretty efficient. It has good performances with redundant data and also can work both in supervised and unsupervised mode. 
but some of the drawbacks, uh, it is not possible to extract path length for individual dimensions. So for the in individual KPIs, which means we cannot extract anomaly score by KPI, and that was the main uh, requirement. Uh, at least at, at, at this uh, solution that we used, it was from scikit-learn in Python, uh, that implementation does not have this possib possibility. It is not possible to visualize isolation trees, which could also be convenient, but the good thing is that we can expand the library in a way that we need it, okay? So we can expand the library in order to visualize isolation trees and in order to extract path length, and that is one of the next steps. Okay, and uh, uh, one more drawback, could have low performance with working with non or slightly deviant features because the path lengths will be similar and then the anomaly score could not be determined uh, so accurately. What about the autoencoders? So for the autoencoders, the main advantage is it is possible to extract error per each dimension because when it reconstructs the input, we have reconstructed output for each of the input KPIs and we can extract the error in terms of anomaly score for each of the KPI. And that is good because we can say this instance was flagged as anomalous and those KPIs like package delays and uh, uh, package transmission success rate are the worst because when they know what KPIs were anomalous, they can go to the root cause analysis and uh, inspect uh, the main drivers of the anomalous behavior. And the auto encoders, uh, uh, coders are also good for catching nonlinear dependencies which we uh, uh, in most cases have in our data and they are convenient for noise reduction. One of the drawbacks, they take too much time with high dimensional data. So whenever you're working with the neural networks, we have uh, here plenty of KPIs, so the dimensionality is huge, it just takes too much time. And also in the autoencoder, uh, they learn to capture as much information as possible and not as much important information, relevant information as possible. So those two are some of the main drawbacks of this algorithm. Some of the challenges that we think uh, we will meet uh, in the uh, future work. Uh, well, uh, one of the biggest challenge is to take a, a higher, a bigger history of the data because here we were working on an hourly level and we took a month of the data, but the idea is to take a year of the data, etc. And just imagine a year of the data on an hourly level, several thousand. Uh, several thousands base stations, more than 100 KPIs, a huge problem. So one of the biggest challenges will be to handle all that data and to uh, make it work automatically. Um, also, uh, one of the challenges is to translate this problem, which is anomaly detection, into a predictive problem, which is anomaly prediction. So to give predictions of anomalous behavior, but for that, we will need the labels for the data, so maybe the output from this phase uh, can be used as label data and to go to some of the prediction models in order to extract, extract the uh, prediction of the future behavior for the base stations. Uh, so those two are the biggest challenges that we think we're going to meet in the future work. And now I will leave the time for the Q&A. Thank you very much for listening. So I will just open the slide, all right? So the first question is, how would you treat anomalies of cat uh, categorical variables? So we did not have the categorical variables here. Uh, and uh, I would think that it would be accurate to convert the categorical variables into numbers. Maybe uh, bec uh, because in isolation forest, it would be possible to convert it to numerical value and then analyze it. But in autoencoders, I don't think it will give accurate results, so it depends, maybe some other solution would be more convenient. Uh, what do you, why do you need these data models instead of just using targets or valid boundaries? Okay, because we were using valid boundaries for five KPIs, and these algorithms, they analyze more than 100 KPIs, and the idea is to analyze 400, 500 KPIs at a time. Uh, why do you need, okay, uh, why did you use accuracy to estimate the quality of the algorithms? Well, it is expected that the fraction of anomalies is small, so the data set is imbalanced. Uh, okay, whenever you have imbalanced data set, you can always 
balance it, so that is not a problem. And also, uh, with the consultations with the domain expert, he analyzed all the flagged anomalies and we perfectly uh, labeled the anomalies. But we, ha we had problems because some of the anomalous instances, they were flagged as normal. So that is the problem. But the instances that we flagged as anomalous, they all really were anomalies. How did you calculate accuracy for unsupervised learning tasks? In comparative analysis, we labeled our data with a simplified algorithm, okay? More questions, right? Okay. Uh, I just took a standard accuracy score. Okay. So the number of corrected classes. Hmm? Number of, uh, the, the portion of corrected predictions. Right? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Seventy-two uh, percent. Okay. Uh, well, the question would be, uh, why do you think um, the, the open coders perform uh, worse? Perform worse. Okay, because they needed more history of the data. They just needed more information, and we only had so amount of information. Data, right? Mm, unlabeled data and but but yeah, plenty of it is unsupervised learning. Uh, we know that, but we just wanted to see what are the uh, the figures were for the label. The figures were for the label. Yeah, yeah, we labeled them, but we are using as unsupervised, and we will using we will be using it as unsupervised. So this is just to to compare, just to see, to take uh, a simple. Um, insight into the model performances. Mm, okay, yeah, that could happen. Yeah, but here I think that they are pretty good because they, they can give us anomalous uh, a score for each KPI that is pretty convenient. Do we have more? Uh, please describe how did you calculate? Okay, what is the accuracy in this case? I responded. Could you explain a little more about how using? Uh, a little more about how using autoencoders for anomaly with KPI. What, what does that mean? So we have uh, 100 KPIs, they go to the encoder, and then they go to the decoder. We get a reconstructed KPI, we calculate the error from each, for each KPI, and the higher the error, that is the anomaly score for a given KPI. Okay? <coughs> Okay. It's a question to ask them, it's uh, So what about the dependency between features? Sure. There are so many features mm -hmm. that you mentioned, mm -hmm. they have very big phase, uh, very big dimensionality. Yeah. Um, so uh, what about dependencies? Do, uh, are, are these models um, um, suffer from dependencies? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, well, isolation forest, and uh, there are some scientific research papers, they uh, do show that uh, using redundant features and highly correlated features do not affect the model performances for the isolation forest. And for the autoencoders, they work with uh, nonlinear uh, relationships, linear, doesn't matter, so that is good. We wanted to place as much KPIs as possible. We know that maybe some KPIs could be put aside, etc., but we wanted to place all the KPIs and to see what the results will be like. Another question. Uh, thank you. Uh, why don't you uh, compare this to methods uh, on the recall measure? Uh, why don't I compare? Accuracy, okay. Recall. recall and precision, right? Uh, yeah, we were pretty good at label. Yeah, maybe that is the good uh, idea. We can do that. And we saw that uh, labeling anomalous behavior is good for us because we really uh, flagged anomalous instances the right way. We had a problem with labeling the normal instances, the anomalous instances as the normal, and they should be flagged as anomalous. So that was the problem. Yeah, we can use precision and recall also. Our MATLAB, Python, 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 Python. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, how you can compare uh, to different sites? Uh, because uh, in different sites in different places. Yeah, yeah. Different mm -hmm. guys. Yeah, so another I idea. Think. Yeah, I, I understand the question. Another idea is to use. Uh, clustering or something like that, or to divide it into rural or urban area, because uh, in different area sites will be, be behave yeah. in different way. They have uh, different uh, yeah, yeah. number of users, etc. So that is a good idea, and we will do that also. How do you figure out the impact of the service? In your slide, you presented the impact from one base station and from a hub. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the next step will be to import, uh, yeah, I didn't say it uh, into the challenges, but the next step is to import the topology and to, to connect with the links behavior, etc. So we will have network topology, we will know which sites are interconnected and which area could be affected. So that is the, the next step. That we can uh, we are already dealing with it. We just know that, I know, site B goes to some site A and C and then we will just use that that set of data for analyzing. Yeah, we will say if, if, for example, if site, site A and B are coming from, are passing through site C, we will know that if site C is affected, it is pretty possible that A and B will also be affected. So that is one of the ideas. So, but, but we should discuss with the domain expert that in more detail. You mentioned that uh, isolation tourists are uh, more accurate, <coughs> but uh, did you uh, uh, make a distinction between false positive and false negative? What is worse than this? Uh, yeah, I, we didn't analyze one against each other, no, no not in, in, in that way, but it is a good idea to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, in any model, you have a type of order. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with this model? And uh, how can you deal with the isolation of forest and uh, these type of orders of forest type of number of trees? Yeah, it has um, uh, pretty simple uh, input parameters. It has number of trees. Uh, number of features that should be analyzed and uh, some scientific papers they say that it, and, and uh, a subsample also a subsample that should be used for building a tree and there are some scientific papers showing that uh, a number of trees of 100 is uh, pretty good and also a subsample of 256 uh, is also a good subsample size so for each kind of problem so so, so you use uh, your uh, model on the language Mm, no, 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 no. Uh, no, because we didn't use labels in the training phase. We just used labels in the evaluation just to check, to take basic insight into the model performance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How is the animal prediction? How do you plan to to do it? Mm -hmm. uh, well, one idea is to use, uh, to label the data by using the autoencoder and isolation forest intersection. So when both of the algorithms say it is anomalous, we will flag it as anomalous, otherwise we will flag it as labeled. And then by using this uh, labeling technique, we will train. You the third one. Hmm? Then you need the third model to... Yeah, classification for prediction, right, right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, re-isolation trees. Ultimately, there must be some threshold to flag instance as anomaly. How is it determined? Hvala puna. Okay, so uh, it is determined based on the domain experts, so uh, it, is, it, it just depends on the domain, on the network, and on the domain expert's opinion. Can you detect new types of anomalies, or can you predict that already happened in the past? Uh, the types of the anomalies, we weren't dealing with it, but maybe a good approach would be to analyze anomalous KPIs and then to say if the problem is on these KPIs, that is one type of the anomalies, if those KPIs are affected, the problem is um, the second of the second group, etc. So maybe that is the idea. Uh, which type of anomaly we can find in subscribers' behavior? Uh, well, I haven't really worked with this kind of a problem, uh, but uh, you can find maybe a contextual anomaly or something like that when you analyze uh, sub subscribers' behavior in some spatial attribute or some time sp uh, attribute, etc. Maybe that is a good approach. So, um, what are I already responded? Haven't really tested it. I just uh, ex uh, extracted accuracy just to get the basic insights. Okay. Do you compete these three guys only online or on daily basis? Can you repeat the question? Do you analyze KPI and anomaly on online or on daily basis? 
uh, okay, uh, this is not in the production, but the idea is to analyze it uh, automatically 24 or 7. Okay. Yeah, and for the domain experts, they will just give us, they will get a signal whenever something is misbehaving, etc. So. I mean that, uh, I think it's clear you will play some break, but not on break. Previous, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. We are remembering it at which point of time something happened, right? Okay. Thank you very much, guys. See you later.